Uh, today I'm going to talk about social media and emergency management. We're going to talk about the strategy and the thinking behind it. And also I'm going to go into details about how we've tried to implement it in the State Control Centre and the real practical uh, lessons that we've learned and the challenges that we've faced doing that. I've identified three main change in mindsets when it comes to using social media effectively. And I think it applies more broadly than social media as well. I think these are changes in mindsets that have happened in this organization since Black Saturday and the Royal Commission and so on. So we'll go through some of those. So previously, I think our attitude was that you know, we, we held the information the community needed, community needed and that we expected them to come to us to get that information, to come to the CFA website, uh, the other agency websites, and get that information. So the move into social media is very much a move towards we'll come to you. We'll take the information to where you, are, you, where the community is, which is on Facebook and Twitter and on mobile devices. Um, and I mean, this applies not just in social media uh, programs like the home bushfire assessment. It's a good example of us taking our information, taking our services to peoples at their home rather than expecting them to come to us. Change of mindset number two. I think in the past we've had um, the attitude that we, we're the people that should decide what the community needs and that they should be grateful for it, whatever we decide that we want to give them. And I think that's very much changed now to uh, us very much more concerned about what the community tell us they want and what they need and we provide that to them. There's also a big argument for sometimes uh, just releasing information and we may not know exactly what the community might do with it. Um, but if you make that data available, make that information available, then that encourages innovation and people come up with new ways of using that that can benefit everybody. The best example of that is planned burns. There's been a big debate about whether or not planned burns should be displayed on the same map uh, as emergency incidents. Now, obviously, with any agencies, we have very specific views about what planned burns are and what emergency incidents are. But from a community point of view, if a, community per if a person sees smoke, they want to go to the website and find out information about it, whether that's coming from a planned burn or an emergency incident. It really doesn't make a lot of difference to the community. So um, there's been a lot of great work done by the information operations team and the IT guys to actually get uh, the planned burn data available. And hopefully uh, very soon we'll, that, all that information will be available on the same map. So that's a really good, uh, a really good step forward. Change of mindset number three. The public is a resource not a liability. <laughs> so again, we, we um, often take the attitude that um, you know, we're the experts and we need to tell the community what to do. And you know, that creates a very passive community who sit and wait to be told what to do. And that's one of the things that we don't want the community to do. We want, we want them to take initiative and be educated and, and make decisions for themselves. So that's an, an app from the San Ramon Valley Fire Department in the United States. It was created after the fire chief was out for a meal at a restaurant um, and he was enjoying the meal and his, some, a couple of his fire trucks pulled up the front. He went out to see what was happening and somebody in the restaurant next door had had a heart attack and had actually died before the, um, the, the uh, fire officers were able to get there and, and use the, um, the defibrillator machine to do CPR. So this app tells people if there's an incident nearby them, it tells them where the nearest defibrillator machine is. And that's obviously empowering the community who, 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 to actually help in that scenario. It's that concept of the, the community being the first responder rather than us. We, we all see ourselves as the first responders, but generally there's community on scene. And so the community are the first people responding to the emergency before the emergency services get there. This is uh, Craig Fugate, who's the head of the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States talking about that same uh, concept. You gotta go with this kind of this hypothesis and that is the public's not a liability, they're a resource. And that oftentimes it's in their own nature <clears throat> to try to share information and they now have tools they never had before. And they're doing it every day. <clears throat> they're doing it just for uh, their routine, how they communicate with friends and families, but also during a crisis. And we're seeing this more and more. For those of you that do the hashtag stuff, try following this hashtag. SMEM, -E Social Media and Emergency Management. 
And you're really starting to see how local and state emergency managers are looking at tools like Twitter and Facebook, not so much as a broadcast tool, but really looking at how people are moving information around and how to incorporate that into their, their tools. The public oftentimes has better information and situational awareness in an area of a disaster than any of the teams and response that are coming from the outside. But we, we, uh, we kind of have this barrier because the public is an official. It's not an official source of information. The other thing is we're not really sure how to do this because we've got a lot of phobias about privacy and how we interact with the public and all of this stuff. But we've seen now in the U.S., from wildfires in California and Boulder to the recent ice storm and snowstorms, the public is putting out better situational awareness than many of our own agencies can with our official data sets. So, what have we been doing at CFA and in Victoria? 2008, we set up our Facebook page. I think it was 2007 we first got into YouTube. So that's quite early on, considering it. The, um, those platforms that have been going for a few years at that stage. But it was very much in the prevention and preparedness phase of emergencies. We weren't getting involved in the response and warnings or anything like that. It was the community education, uh, total fire bans, fire danger ratings, that sort of information that we were providing to people on social media. But last year, uh, there was very much a move towards response and getting social media integrated within the response phase. Why did we do that? Basically, the speed and the reach that social media gives you are the two most basic reasons. Obviously, you can reach a lot of people very quickly. And those people can be uh, journalists who then rebroadcast that over more traditional mediums as well. So everyone benefits from that speed, not just people on social media. Quite light, light hearted look at it, but it's, you know, technically it's true. Uh, you could easily get a message from one side of America to the other before the earthquake arrived. More reasons why we do it. Obviously, the, um, the Bushfires Royal Commission, the focus on community education and warnings after that, so we're looking at new ways of getting information and warnings to people. Um, and I think, you know, I think the, the attitude has been it's not, we need to think, look at new ways of doing it. It's not just a matter of trying to do what, more of what we did before or trying to do what we did before better, but it's really trying to look at new ways uh, of getting warnings to people. And also the uh, Victorian Floods Review specifically addressed the uh, need to use uh, social media for warnings. And also interestingly, looking at uh, social media as a source of information to and from the public, so I think, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, people were using social media to push information out to people. Um, but really now we're in the space of looking at using it to push information out to people, but also how do we get information in from people? So that intelligence gathering, which has been recognized at the, uh, the highest levels. This is a common comment that we had on our Facebook page. Another good reason why we do it is that uh, for Sarah, it's the only way she can get it, warning information. She hasn't got radio reception. He doesn't have a connection to the internet, um, and, and that's because often people don't have, don't have credit in their phones to access the internet on their phones, but they do have a free, with their mobile package, they have a free access to Facebook. So Facebook is probably, it could be the only contact with the internet that they have. And also the generational argument that a lot of younger people rely very much more on online news sources than the traditional me uh, media. So the big, the big step forward, I suppose, last year was the integration of social media into One Source One Message. Um, for those of you who don't know, One Source One Message is the system that our information officers use to get warnings out from incident control centers around the state. Um, they get messages out to various different mediums. So they, as soon as they put the message into the system, it goes onto the website, goes out to the media, traditional media, it goes onto the RSS feed various other mediums. And what we did last year was get that integrated, get social media integrated to that. So as soon as a, a warning is issued, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they'll automatically go on to Facebook and our Twitter accounts. Uh, 
And then that's complemented by manual updates uh, from our media units. So that's the sort of information that the media are inquiring about, how many trucks, um, just more information about what's happening with the incident. Here's an example of, of that. So this one, the one at the top there is a manual tweet by our media unit promoting the township protection plans that are available for the areas that are, are currently involved in the fires. And the thinking behind that is that you have people's attention while the fires are happening, so it's a good, good time to promote the township protection plans, even though you'd hope people were looking at them before the fire happens. And then the next two are the automatic uh, posts from Awesome. And then the fourth one, another manual tweet from our media officers. And this is just an example of the same thing on Facebook, where you've got the automatic warning at the top, and then at uh, what, 40, 30, 39 minutes later, we've got a manual tweet from the, from the media team saying that the fire is now under control, or a manual post to the Facebook page. So that's how we do it year round, as it were, in CFA, managed by the obviously through the, the awesome information operations team and the, and the on-call media people, the 24-7 media coverage that we provide manages those accounts. When it comes to the state control centre, obviously a bit more complicated, more agencies involved, generally much busier times when there's major incidents happening. So we needed to really look at how we would manage this on a multi-agency, uh, multi-hazard basis. So what we did was bring a paper to the Strategic Fire and Flood Forum which consists of the Fire Services Commissioner and all the chiefs of all the different agencies uh, to uh, propose the establishment of two new roles in the State Control Centre. First one being Media Officer Social Media, sitting with the Media Management Unit, and the Social Media Monitor, sitting with the Public Information Section and the Community Warnings and Advice Officer. There were three principles in that paper which were supported by the uh, Fire Services Commissioner and the chiefs. One that obviously we agree and believe that the use of social media helps us achieve our core mission. That we need to engage with people year round in social media and build up that credibility and trust um, to, to just suddenly uh, try and engage with people when there's an emergency happening, it's really too late. You need to have built up that credibility and trust so that people know where to find you and believe what you're saying. And that an acceptance that agencies have a role to play in this. There, there was an argument that um, this is too, too difficult for, it's not, it's not our area of expertise in the emergency services, social media, so we should stay out of it um, and leave that to traditional media. And we'll just use our traditional, uh, traditional mediums to get information to the, to the traditional media and then let them worry about social media. But really that's the situation you'd be in then would be that you'd be engaging with people in the, re in the preparation and planning phases and then suddenly disappear during response and then return for recovery again, which just doesn't make any sense. The principle here as well of, of um, engaging in the exchange of timely, relevant and tailored information is important, um, which once again gets the concept of uh, intelligence gathering and the, what information can we get from social media that could help us. Media officer social media. It's their role to make sure that the latest information is posted to social media. So that'll be a combination, as we said before, of the automatic posts and the manual. Myth busting and clarifying is another very crucial role. Obviously anyone can post whatever they want to social media. Rumours do start generally. They're not malicious rumours, they're generally well-meaning people who have heard something and, and repeat it and, and then that rumour spreads very quickly because of the nature of social media. So there's a real uh, need and an ability. I mean, it's quite easy to squash a rumour. The Queensland Police found it quite easy to squash rumours uh, about dams busting and so on just by um, tweeting on their account or putting on their face Facebook page account because they had 180,000 followers. Um, and that actually kept the, me the traditional media in check as well. If they posted something saying it was incorrect, they found Sky News and other traditional media outlets were removing uh, rumours from their websites as well. 
and to manage expectations. That's obviously um, when it's very busy. We may not be able to answer every single question we get in social media, but Peter Baker, actually from, from uh, F and EM, used the analogy of, that we use for fire trucks during, uh, you know, when there's major bushfires on, we are quite clear and forthright with the community that we won't get a fire truck to every house when there's major emergencies happening. So in the same light, we have to be open and honest and manage expectations to tell people, look, we're not going to be able to answer every single question we get uh, when there's major emergencies happening, but we'll try and prioritise and, 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 and deal with what we, we can deal with. The challenges that we find in this role, speed, information flow, authorisation, it's a common, it's not, it's, it's a common issue that um, isn't specific to social media. I mean, I've worked at CFA for seven years doing media work uh, during emergencies and the ability to get speedy information authorised has always been an issue even before social media existed. It's just that it's a lot more obvious and a lot more, um, you know, the spotlight's really sh shone on it now. So it's how we, how we can speed that up and really stay credible because if, if we have independent accounts, independent uh, social media accounts who have more up-to-date information than we have, then we lose all credibility and why would people follow us or listen to what we're saying when they can get uh, more up-to-date stuff from, uh, from other accounts. Challenges of resourcing, um, you know, finding suitably qualified people to, um, to fill that role was a bit of an issue, though we were able to fill it. There's quite a, uh, we did some joint training exercises with DSA, SES, CFA and MFB, and we have quite a pool of people uh, from the communication sides of the organisations who can fill that role. And it also exposes inconsistencies and, and the slower medium. So, and I mean, I, the best example of that, I suppose, is if uh, a warning's been issued saying a fire's out of control, and then that situation changes and the fire now is brought under control, it, takes, it can take uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to update that uh, awesome message on the website. Um, so the, the dilemma we're in is, do we wait 15 minutes with social media to tell people that the fire's under control and what we're doing then is holding information back from the community. Uh, but if we do post it, then the potential of creating co uh, conf uh, contradictions between the information, so people see on social media they say the fire's under control, but on the website it still says it's out of control, so how do we manage that? So the, the compromise we came to was that we would issue the, the warning, and so issue the updated information on social media and, and highlight that the information will be updated shortly on the website. And that way, and then make sure that the information is updated on the website. The social media monitor is uh, an intelligence gathering role. So their job is to identify and monitor relevant social media to do with the, whatever the emergency is, to analyze and assess that information, and to feed it back into the SEC structures. This is probably a more challenging role. The first problem was finding suitable personnel and really because really for this role you need someone who's quite experienced in emergency management who can understand the potential significance of information from an operational point of view, you know, a particular smoke pattern or cloud pattern or you know, changing weather conditions that someone, a member of the community might be talking about in social media. You need to be able to identify, well, is that relevant from an operational point of view? And then also someone with, combines that with social media skills. Filtering and verifying social media information, this is the common question we get asked and there's no easy ans answer for it. Everyone around the world is trying to come up with better ways of filtering and verifying information you get in social media. And it, it can be a bit overwhelming, but there are ways of doing it. Um, there are various, I mean, you've got trusted sources. If, if, if it's people that you know, um, if it's our own members, for example, uh, passing information on, or um, people that you've built up a relationship with over time that you trust, and that's a way of verifying it. And there's also a, way, a number of uh, research projects underway. University of Melbourne are looking at how they can filter and analyze tweets using all sorts of complicated algorithms that can filter out and get the, um, the best stuff to the top. So there's no, uh, it's a challenge, um, but it's a challenge that everyone around the world is working on. And then just the challenge of embedding a new, a new uh, system into the traditional um, state control centre structures, the EAM structures. Uh, it'll take a bit of time just to get that uh, embedded into the system, get people trusting it. So these are some examples of the benefits 
that we saw over the summer. A good example of the myth busting. Uh, so someone had heard a rumor locally that the fire had started up again. And we were able to confirm reasonably quickly that that wasn't the case. And obviously we need to be careful with that. It took me, it took me 15 minutes to confirm that because don't, you don't want to go on and say, no, our information says it's not started up, and then you discover that our information was wrong because that loses you all credibility. So I needed to be really confident that um, the fire hadn't started up again before I posted that. The correction of errors and inconsistencies. We spoke earlier about the challenges being that social media can highlight the inconsistencies in our information. And that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity uh, to actually deal with that. There's the inconsistencies between the statuses of the fires. People were saying, you know, on the website it says this, and, and here you're saying that. You know, what's actually happening? Um, so we were able to uh, find out what was happening, clear up the inconsistencies, get everything consistent, and post that back to social media. So it allows us to um, fix any errors in our information very quickly. That could, that's the sort of thing that's always happened, but it may have been, you know, we, we just may never have known about it in the past. As I mentioned earlier, reach beyond social media. It's not just people who use social media that benefit from this. The Queensland Police, again, the director of media there, tells the, um, uses the analogy of a, a senior citizen sheltering under her table with the wind-up radio, listening to the emergency information, and she's actually getting her information from Twitter because they're putting their information out to the journalists via Twitter and they're rebroadcasting that on radio. So everyone benefits from it. So the challenge is, at times it's been a bit like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole to fit the um, social media into our traditional structures. And I think that basically comes from the way that we generally have worked in the past, very command and control, linear, hierarchical sort of information flow. And really that isn't what Social media is all about. Social media is very much a flexible network, an improvised medium. So we've been trying to see how we can bridge the gap between those two ways of working, our um, linear uh, hierarchical way of working and, and, and social media. How do we um, try and make that work? So we've done a lot of work in trying to understand the concerns. Um, we've had a lot of, obviously, discussions and debate. We've had meetings with the state duty officers, presentations to try and um, explain what it is we're doing and that there's a lot of strategy and thinking behind what we're doing. Because a lot of the misunderstandings, a lot of the, um, the lack, a lot of the, the wariness is just due, due to a lack of understanding or a lack of us telling people what we're doing. So, as I say, we've had meetings, uh, we've done up, guides and procedures, um, flexible guides and procedures that really give some foundation to what it is we're doing so that people uh, have, you know, have faith in what we are doing. Practical examples and case studies are always very useful. Uh, the Queensland Police uh, case study is very useful for getting um, people to understand the benefits and the potential of it. And hopefully uh, the work that we're doing in Victoria can provide case studies for other people to, uh, to use to try and encourage their organisations to move down this path. Advocating on behalf of the community is, is really about, I think, I've noticed quite a bit uh, in this sector that we, we're very f we can be very focused on what suits us and what, how we want to arrange things that fit our agencies and fit the way we work. And in this area we really have to always remind ourselves, take a step back and think about what is it the community wants. So the example of the plan burns earlier is a good example. What is it the community is expecting out of this? The Fire Services Commissioner uh, recently at a, a conference I was at spoke about interoperability. It's a term that we've all heard bandied around and generally we see that as meaning interoperability between agencies. Uh, but the Fire Services Commissioner takes that one step further and says that we have to be, interoperability has to apply to the community as well. So whatever systems and, and you know, whatever systems we're using have to be interoperable with the community as well. So I think that's a very important thing to remember when we think about inter interoperability. And really, we, um, you know, it's all of our duties to, to take a step back and think about that and, and remove the blinkers at times and think what the community actually want out of this. Integrating into exercise is obviously very important as well. To do with embedding the processes and, and getting... Um, other emergency managers to understand how this will work within their systems. So we were very lucky last year to, 
through the OESC to um, run an exercise, multi-agency exercise, which did just that. This exercise is the first of its type. It's the first in Australia, and it's going to really push some boundaries here. I'm very keen to promote social media in times of emergency. If we don't dominate this space, others will. And this has to be a very credible source of information. So it's vital that it's us that are putting the messages out and we're getting credible messages back from the community who trust this as a credible source of how they get information in times of crisis. The Firebell pilot training exercise aimed to create a realistic simulation of social media. This allowed staff who may be appointed to the media officer, social media, and social media monitor positions to train and exercise the use of social media tools during a significant emergency situation. The pilot training exercise used a scenario where in a bushfire encompassed the urban fringe of Melbourne, while simultaneously a significant storm cell resulted in flash flooding in a regional city of Victoria. This multi-hazard scenario ensured that staff from different organisations were involved. The four-hour exercise was run at the State Control Centre, where staff interacted with the simulation as the scenario played out over five phases with pre-planned escalating levels of online community apprehension about the events. I'd count myself extremely comfortable with social media, but I've never dealt with this kind of volume of requests before, and it's quite overwhelming. Um, I've never had to, to deal with multiple platforms of just everything firing at once, so there's been a number of things that have come up that um, I never really would have thought of otherwise, so it's, it's been pretty stressful but very valuable. I think it's a way of um, them being able to get official messages through um, through channels that they're familiar with um, and it's a way of them being able to get accurate information and sort of um, being able to dispel the myths of, of you know people being helpful and offering advice but it not being quite right. I think the trial for the social media aspect of what all the agencies are trying to do is crucial. Um, it's one thing for us to develop ideas and regulations and response guides in a room quietly in peacetime but to actually see them practiced is, is, a, is a huge uh, bonus I think for us and certainly we've identified some areas that we already need to work on. Um, some of them will be significant in terms of what do we do when there's a huge volume of responses coming in, do we focus on the ones that are the most dire if there's some responses for instance that have fire in their homes already, do we have to focus on those or do we focus on the generalised information and how we get that out. Um, even developing the roles themselves so people know exactly what they're responsible for when they first step in. That was one of the first things we identified. So certainly scope for expanding it, um, definitely see enormous value in it. The critical thing was a partnership, a collaboration of all of the emergency services uh, organisations and agencies of Victoria being all in the room at the same time because uh, on the day is not the day to be doing this for the first time. So the opportunity to exercise with all the people you'd be working with on the day when it happens, I think is the key thing and around getting it right, the accuracy of the information, becoming that trusted source of information, being credible, being present out there in the social media environment as the one trusted source and being confident to be in that space. That's it. Thanks very much again for coming. Um...